The devil knows that if he can control your thought life, he can control your body chemistry and cause disease. And one of the tools that he uses is fear, anxiety, and stress. If you are sick, you are not going to have much of an impact for God's kingdom, and you are not going to fulfill his calling on your life. Understanding the enemy will help you overcome him. Understanding how fear, anxiety, and stress works in your brain and its subsequent reaction in your body will help you to control it. Fear, anxiety, and stress is a toxic stronghold or thorn tree in your mind which disrupts the way in which you function spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, and physically. Stress is a modern term, but the Greek and Hebrew and English would identify it as fear. And another word is anxiety. We could also use the word worry. Let's define stress. Stress is the mind and body's response to any pressure that would disrupt a normal peaceful state. It is your brain converting that thought into a physical reaction in your body. Stress is a global term for the extreme strain on your body and its organ systems as a result of toxic thinking. Fear is the root of stress. Our body moves into a toxic state when our thoughts become toxic as a result of fear. Fear is a spiritual force that triggers more than 1,400 known harmful physical and chemical responses in your body, and it activates more than 30 different hormones and neurotransmitters. This has an incredible detrimental effect on your body. According to Hosea 4 verse 6, God's children are perishing because of lack of knowledge. Fear, anxiety and stress is destroying your body behind the scenes and you don't even know it. Initially, you don't even realize that it's happening and that's scary. Many people's minds and thought life are plagued by fear. Fear of tomorrow, fear of finances, fear of disease, fear of death. Fear of security, fear of man, fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of abandonment, fear of trains, planes, the list is endless. Anything that takes away our freedom produces fear. Any time we are humiliated, oppressed, victimized, verbally abused, emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused, or even oppressive legalistic church abuse, that crushes people's spirits are all tragedy situations that has the potential to produce fear and the resultant stress reaction in our body. There are three stages of stress. These stages are a good example of how toxic thinking can cause extreme physical reactions that damage almost every organ system in our body. Stage one of stress is called the alarm stage or the fight or flight response. This is a reaction generated by your hypothalamus, pituitary gland, sympathetic nervous system, and your adrenal glands, which are on top of your kidneys. The first stage of stress is the sweaty palm, heart beating fast, adrenaline pumping reaction that was designed by God as a survival mechanism in emergency situations. This is what you need when you suddenly have to swerve your car to avoid hitting something or when you suddenly have to run for your life when you bump into a snake or a lion in the bush. This physical response was designed to counteract the danger 
by mobilizing the body's resources for immediate physical activity. In essence, the first stage of stress or the alarm reaction makes sure that large amounts of glucose for energy and oxygen are transported in the blood to the organs that are most involved in warding off the danger, which would include the following. The muscles in your arms and legs to either fight off the attacker or danger or to run away, in other words, flight. Hence the term fight or flight response. Blood with oxygen and energy is diverted to the brain, which becomes highly alert. You are focused and you're thinking very clearly. Your heart rate increases and the strength of the pumping action of your heart also increases to pump as much blood as possible to your brain and muscles. This is why you can feel your heart beating fast after you've just had a fright. Your rate of breathing will increase and your trachea, which is your windpipe, becomes wider so that you can breathe in more air and get more oxygen, which is needed by your brain, heart and muscles. The liver increases the levels of glucose and fat in your bloodstream, and this is for increased energy, which is needed again by the brain, heart and muscles. The spleen, which is the storage reservoir for blood, contracts, and it discharges more blood into the bloodstream. Blood is directed away from your skin and digestive system, and it's sent to your heart and muscles. This is because the digestive system is not needed in a danger situation. There's no time to eat when you need to run for your life. So the alarm reaction makes you alert, it makes you strong and focused, and it enables you to react quickly. Stage 1 of stress will also help you to build memory. It enables your nerve cells to build memory branches very effectively and efficiently. You are actually in stage 1 of stress at the moment, because your brain has to take in all the information that you are listening to, and it must be able to build memories. The chemicals that are released during this reaction will alert you, and they help with memory building. It helps you to focus and to concentrate, which is a good thing. In stage 1 of stress, a hormone called CRF is released from your hypothalamus in small quantities. CRF stands for corticotropin releasing hormone. To make it easier and to avoid using confusing medical terms, I'll call CRF the yellow hormone. This yellow hormone is an excellent chemical to start building memory. The yellow chemical stimulates the pituitary gland in the brain to release a small amount of a chemical called ACTH. ACTH stands for adrenocorticotropic hormone, but we'll call this the red hormone. The red hormone keeps you alert. It stimulates the adrenal glands on top of the kidneys to release hormones called adrenaline and cortisol. These hormones are all very good in small quantities to keep you alert and focused. What happens then is the adrenaline and cortisol will go to the brain and it will tell the hypothalamus and pituitary gland that there's enough adrenaline and cortisol in the bloodstream and that they can stop producing the yellow and red hormones. And this is what is called a negative feedback loop. So the process stops and you go into a settled, peaceful state of processing and building memory. As soon as you lose attention again, your body will be shifted back into that cycle where more yellow and red hormones will be produced again. This is a positive cycle when you have short bursts of these chemicals for short periods of time. Stress becomes harmful when you have been in stage 1 for too long, or when it is triggered by a negative toxic thought. This then makes you shift into stage 2 of stress, which is also called the resistance stage or acute long-term stress. If you shift from being alert to being anxious, fearful, worried, angry or bitter, the hypothalamus will respond by secreting too much of the yellow hormone. In large quantities, the chemical structure of the yellow hormone changes. And because the chemical structure of that yellow hormone changes in stage 2 of stress, we'll now refer to it as the black hormone. So in excessive quantities, the yellow hormone shifts from being a good hormone that builds memory to a black hormone, which the medical field has called the chemical of negative expectation, in other words, dread. The black hormone then stimulates the pituitary gland to release the red hormone in excessive quantities. 
The red hormone in large quantities is what the medical field calls the fear hormone. So this is fear in physical form. When the adrenaline and cortisol go back to the brain to tell it to stop secreting the yellow and red hormones, the large quantities of those yellow and red hormones will override this negative feedback loop. So as a result, large quantities of adrenaline and cortisol are now produced. So now the situation is that there is too much yellow hormone, too much red hormone, and too much adrenaline and cortisol that are chaotically flowing through your whole body. And this is what stage two of stress is. These stress hormones in large quantities are destructive over time because they're not supposed to flow continuously, only in short bursts. A burst of stress is much healthier than constant daily stress, which puts your body into a complete state of illness, mentally and physically. When all of these stress hormones are flowing in large quantities, you can't hear your heart, as the ANF is drowned out and overwhelmed by all of those stress chemicals. So what God created to help you in an emergency situation has now turned on you and begun to destroy your body. What was meant for good has now become bad. Let's do a quick summary of stage two. The hypothalamus produces too much of the yellow hormone. In excessive quantities, the um, chemical structure of the yellow hormone changes and it becomes the black hormone, which the medical um, community has called the chemical of ne negative expectation or dread. <laughs> Too much of the red hormone, which is the fear hormone, is secreted from the pituitary gland. Too much cortisol and adrenaline, which are the stress hormones, are now being released from the adrenal gland, which were on top of the kidneys. All of the electrical and chemical feedback loops have become disrupted when the adrenaline and cortisol goes back to the hypothalamus to tell it to stop secreting the yellow and red hormones. That message is drowned out by the excessive quantities of the yellow and red hormones. So the hypothalamus continues to produce too much of the yellow hormone and the negative cycle perpetuates. As high levels of cortisol flow over your brain, the branches of the memories on your nerves begin to shrink. This is what is, happens, for example, when you go into an exam and you suddenly go blank, where you suddenly can't remember anything. Once the cortisol levels have been reduced, the branches will come up again and you will be able to recall that information again. But over time, the cortisol, like battery acid, will literally flow through and corrode those branches and break off those branches on that memory. And now you have broken memory on the branches of your nerves. As a result, your thinking becomes foggy. You begin to have difficulty concentrating. You have trouble with your memory, where you become forgetful and your creativity levels drop. This is the stage where you start feeling physically unwell where all sorts of vague symptoms develop. You are not so sick that you need to um, be bedridden, but you no longer wake up in the morning feeling full of the joys of spring. You start feeling tense, anxious, overwhelmed, out of control, and you begin to feel like giving up. You will find that you start getting constant aches and pains, and you're suddenly at the doctor more than you'd like to be. Everything seems to be going wrong with your body, Whatever infection is out there, you seem to be catching, and so on. Now you can stay in stage 2 of stress for 10, 20, 30 or more years, and you will shift in and out of the stage 2 of stress. When you relax, for example, when you have a great time on the weekend, or you go to a movie, the stress hormones will subside, and the whole cycle will calm down, and you will rejuvenate a bit. But then you will shift back into stage 2 of stress again. And over time, you will begin to shift into stage two too quickly. And it becomes easier and easier for you to shift into that negative state where there's high levels of stress hormones, and it becomes more and more difficult to control. Eventually, after 10 or 20 or 30 years of this, you'll shift into stage three of stress. Stage three is when it gets very dangerous. This is where you see the big illnesses coming in. Stage 3 is also called the exhaust, or exhaustion stage or death cycle. This is where the whole system never stops reacting. The adrenal glands on top of the kidneys become enlarged. All organs are in heightened alert for too long, 
your organs don't relax and they become exhausted and begin to break down. And at this stage, you feel very ill. Memory and all mental functions decrease. There's a feeling of loss of control and failure. And over time, your mind and emotions simply burn out. Tissue damage occurs and changes occur at a cellular level. You have special receptors on the surface of the cells in your body that respond to the chemicals that flow in your bloodstream. You have hundreds of different chemicals flowing through your body, such as steroids, peptides and hormones, that are all carrying a copy of the memory that was formed in your mind, as well as emotion. They are the information emotion molecules that I spoke about in session 2. The receptors have a very specific shape that fits into a specific chemical, just like a key fits into a lock. For example, the square chemical in this picture fits in the receptor, but the oval one can't. When a chemical binds to its receptor on the surface of a cell, it will stimulate a specific reaction, for example metabolism or cell growth. Now there are thousands of different receptors on the surface of a cell that the different chemicals and hormones in the bloodstream will bind to to stimulate a specific reaction in the, bo in the cells of your body. So how does a, a specific chemical find its specific receptor that it fits into amongst thousands of the different receptors on the surface of your body cells? Well, the chemicals vibrate as they pass over the surface of the body and the receptor that it fits into has a corresponding vibration. And this is what is referred to as your body's music, because vibrations are basically sound waves. As well as good chemicals flowing in our bloodstream, we also have bad substances, for example cancer cells, bacteria or flu viruses. If you are not stressed, a bacteria or a parasite or, or flu virus will try and get into the cell, but they won't be able to fit into the receptor. It's like trying to put the wrong key into a lock. You won't be able to open the door. Eventually, your immune system will send out killer cells that, will go, that will go and kill that bacteria or flu virus. But if you shift into stage 2 of stress, the high levels of stress hormones will corrode and damage those receptors like battery acid. So whatever is floating past will be able to drop into the cell. So the cell gets what it needs plus what it doesn't need. In other words, harmful things like bacteria and viruses. That is why it's easier for you to catch the flu or to get sick when you are stressed out. For example, students at exam time. Any of the sicknesses that are out there will hit you and you will feel constantly exhausted because the cells have damaged receptors and they are just accepting anything that is floating around. But fortunately, when you deal with that toxic thinking by eradicating fear and anxiety and stress from your thought life and you choose to think correctly, your nerve structure in your brain is changed. Your body is connected to your brain and those receptors will be healed and repaired and function as they were supposed to again. This is because your brain takes your, th your thought life and converts it into a physical reaction. Here is a reaction on a cellular level which is damage to the receptors on the surface of the body cell because of fear, anxiety and stress in your thought life. But God is an awesome God. We can mess up our body for years with toxic thinking, but by choosing to think correctly, we can start healing. When the high levels of stress hormones are flowing through your body in stage 2 and 3 of stress, something very interesting is that they don't just randomly move through your body, causing damage just anywhere. They move in a very specific sequence of attack. 
The heart and blood vessels are where the destructive chemicals go first. Now if you think of it, the heart pumps blood, and the Bible says that the life is in the blood. So in terms of the plan of the attack of the enemy, if you can kill and squeeze the life of a person, you've already started winning the battle. High blood pressure, arrhythmias, which means abnormal heart rhythm, angina, which is chest pain because there's insufficient blood supply to the heart, heart valve disease, heart attacks, and heart failure begin to set in. Fear, anxiety, and stress also plays a role in the development of cardiomyopathy, which is abnormal functioning of the heart muscle. You can get inflammation of the heart muscle and its covering, which is myocarditis and pericarditis and also DVT, which stands for deep vein thrombosis, which is basically a clot in the leg. This is before it gets to your brain, so you still have clear thinking at this stage. Your mind is still focused because it hasn't been affected yet. Your heart is weakened first. We often hear of young men in the prime of their lives who've never seemed to have a day sickness suddenly dropping down dead in the gym. This is from toxic thinking and emotions that were not dealt with. Eventually the stress is built up and built up internally, and then wham, it hits the heart and the person drops down dead. The statistics say that 750,000 people die in America every year as a result of heart disease, and 50% of that is due to sudden cardiac death. Here's an interesting scripture. In Luke 21 verse 26, it says, In the last days, men's hearts will fail them because of fear. The next area that these harmful stress chemical, uh, chemicals attack is the defense system, which is your immune system. The immune system is an army of cells that defend you from harmful things such as viruses, bacteria, parasites, and cancer cells. When your immune system detects these harmful substances in your bloodstream and body tissue, it will either destroy or remove it. So if the enemy can kill the life of the person, which is the heart, and break down the defense, which is the immune system, he's winning the battle. I explained previously how the high levels of these stress chemicals will corrode the receptors on the surface of body cells. This then enables toxins, viruses, and bacteria to enter the cells and begin to cause disease. Well, high levels of the stress hormone cortisol will also directly kill and prevent the production of different cells of the immune system. Now that your immune system is weakened, you have no defense system against harmful things like bacteria, parasites, viruses, and fungal infections, for example, candida. Examples of parasitic infections like bahasia and malaria will now be able to infect your body. You are susceptible to catching any infection that is going around. Most bacteria, parasites, and fungus cannot infect you unless your immune system is weakened. When the immune system is damaged, you will also end up with allergies, which I'll discuss in detail in the next session. There's a specific cell called interleukin-2 in your immune system. This cell is like a policeman. It puts up roadblocks in your bloodstream and body tissues, and it checks all of the cells, hormones, and chemicals that drive past. This policeman is able to recognize harmful cancer cells, bacteria, and viruses by detecting the foreign proteins on their cell wall. When the policeman recognizes these harmful substances in the bloodstream, he sends messages to other killer cells of the immune system. Those killer cells will then come and kill those harmful substances before they are able to cause sickness in your body. But during stage 2 and 3 of stress, the high levels of the hormone cortisol will distort the DNA of the killer cells of your immune system so that they are now less effective in being able to kill those harmful cells. The policeman, interleukin-2, is also damaged, so now he's no longer able to recognize the cancer cells, bacteria, and viruses as foreign harmful substances when they drive past him. Therefore, instead of alerting the other cells of the immune system to come and kill these harmful substances, he says, Hello, cancer. Hello, Mr. Bacteria and Miss Virus. How nice to see you. Welcome to the body. Thank you for coming. Have a nice day. And so you become what is called infection-prone, where you have infectious diseases that just don't seem to go away. The devil knows 
that if he can get you into sin by getting you fearful, anxious, and stressed spiritually, he can compromise your immune system so that it is weakened and unable to recognize the harmful things such as bacteria, viruses, and cancer cells. Then he can make you physically vulnerable to any illness he wants to bring upon you. We give him permission to do it in our sin. Fear and anxiety is a sin because it is outright disobedience to the word of God. God said, do not fear, 365 times in the Bible. If somebody said something to you 365 times, don't you think that they are trying to get a very important message across to you? Fear is a lethal poison, and Satan knows it. It's time that you know what your enemy knows about you, so that you will not perish for lack of knowledge. Let's have a look at Proverbs 17 verse 22. A happy heart is good medicine, and a cheerful mind works healing, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. There is so much medical truth in this scripture, it is unbelievable. The cells of the immune system are formed in the bone marrow, which is the bones. A person who is broken, fearful, stressed, anxious, and depressed has a dried out and destroyed immune system. I've just explained that cortisol in excessive quantities during stage 2 and 3 of stress kills the cells of the immune system, so it literally dries out the bone marrow. When you get rid of fear, anxiety, and stress in your thought life, those stress hormones are no longer produced. The cells of the immune system remultiply and regain their strength, and your immune system recovers and functions as it should. A cheerful mind works healing. Because whatever is going on in your thought life, your brain converts into a physical reaction. The interleukin-2, which is the policeman, recovers, and he then recognizes the cancer, bacteria, viruses, parasites, or fungus, and he alerts the cells of the immune system to come and kill off that infection, and the body heals. God created and designed our immune system so that it is strong enough to kill off any cancer or infection, but there is a condition. You must be a doer of the word. In other words, you must do what God said, which is not to fear or have anxiety or worry about anything. After weakening the heart and breaking down your defense system, the stress hormones will then attack the brain. Fatigue, lethargy, exhaustion, insomnia, which is the inability to sleep, lack of peace, phobia, and panic attacks, poor memory, foggy thinking will all begin to set in, and by this stage you are feeling really sick. I just want to make a point here. Not everybody will get an illness on all three levels. It depends where your genetic weakness is. So for example, if you have a great heart, then you might just get a little rise in blood pressure and maybe a bit of angina, but you won't get a heart attack. Somebody who has a weak heart may have a massive heart attack or a stroke. So if you have a strong heart, you might have manifestations in your immune system, which hits your pancreas or your skin and so on. In other words, wherever you have a weakness, that is where you are going to see the most problems in your body. The chain will break at the weakest link. It may by bypass both your heart and immune system, where you just have minor nagging illnesses. And then when it gets to your brain, then boy, does the, exha the exhaustion, foggy thinking, and insomnia set in. The next area to be hit by these high levels of stress hormones is your digestive system. So indigestion, constipation, diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, cramping, stomach ulcers, reflux, which is also known as heartburn, irritable bowel syndrome, ulcerative colitis, and malabsorption will all begin to develop. Most gastrointestinal diseases are caused by not having peace in your heart regarding some issue in your life. Fear, anxiety and stress is a powerful force behind fertility problems and also absent or irregular menstrual periods. It affects the growth of children. Stress can reduce the growth hormone by up to 87%. And you'll notice that children who come from stress, stressful or abusive home backgrounds are very short. 
stress hormones will then also begin to hit your muscles, causing muscular tension. For example, you'll develop tension headaches or a sore neck or a muscle contraction backache. Fear, anxiety and stress also plays a partial role in the development of hypothyroidism, which is an underactive thyroid, or hyperthyroidism, which is an overactive thyroid. Strokes and non-bacterial inflammation, for example prostatitis, or interstitial cystitis, which is inflammation of the bladder, can also be caused by fear, anxiety and stress. High levels of the stress hormones cortisol will delay healings of wounds and also decrease bone formation. Fear, anxiety and stress, together with bitterness and unforgiveness, also plays a role in the development of most cancers. And I'm going to talk about cancer in detail in session 7. Let's talk about stress in children. I explained previously that children take 18 years for their brains to grow and fully mature. The stress that children experience is much greater than what we as adults experience. It is catastrophic, to put it mildly. What we experience as moderate stress for children is catastrophic because the brain is still growing and it's in the devel developmental phase. It is very vulnerable and susceptible. The patterns for adulthood are set during childhood. So an excessively stressed child will be prone to lifelong stress-related illnesses. For example, research has shown that children who have been exposed to excessive levels of stress before the age of 12 will increase their chance of cancer by 30%. Research has also shown that in pregnant mothers who are, are very stressed out, more than 60% of the oxygen is channeled away from the baby. This is because when you are stressed, your body is in that state of fight or flight, where your body is going to be geared up to run or fight from some form of danger. So the blood with the oxygen and nutrients is channeled away from the womb to your brain and muscles. So the baby is deprived of oxygen and nutrients, and therefore it experiences severe stress in the womb as well. Children are exposed to excessive levels of stress. For example, when you try to make your children do too many activities. School and sports all day, plus one extra lesson after the next. Then they flop in front of the TV at night, exhausted from stress. Research has shown that if you try to push your children and force them faster through their academics than they were designed to do, you actually decrease their intelligence because of stress. The stress will impair the functioning of the brain. We have become so success-orientated and so success-driven. Our children are paying a very high price for our drivenness to perform, to achieve, to be the best, and for perfectionism. Parents, it's time to stop it, please. Lay off your children. They are little. They are supposed to be playing in the rivers and in the sand and playing with the dog and so forth. Get them away from the TV. We need to teach our children to play. Playing is an essential part of a child's physical, emotional and intellectual development. We need to be careful how we expose our children to stress. Their brains are not fully developed and as parents, teachers and pastors and so on, we need to guide them and walk them through what they are going through. Children cannot verbalize and express their emotions as well as we can, so it will come out in behavior problems. They are finding a lot of ADHD symptoms coming from classroom-induced stress. We have a huge responsibility to reduce stress in our children's lives and to let them have more fun, play more, and by giving them more love. The best ways of dealing with stress in children is play and love. Give them lots of love, hugs and touches, and reduce their activities. Dr. Caroline Leaf advises parents not to allow their children to do more than two or three activities a week. And those activities must be both physical and creative. For example, two sports days and one art or music day. Playing a musical instrument, even if they don't play well, calms down a lot of stress in the brain. We are seeing a lot of problems in children today because of stress. Thirty years ago, the biggest problem was chewing chewing gum and not throwing it into the dustbin. Now our biggest problem is children have to be screened for guns in school. So we need to protect our children and ourselves 
from fear, anxiety, and stress. Science has told me that for every thought that you have, either conscious or unconscious, there is a corresponding nerve signal, hormone, neuro neurotransmitter, or chemical released. If you are not thinking correctly, because fear, anxiety, and stress is dominating your thought life, your body is going to be put into a state of dis-ease. One unresolved issue that is robbing you of your peace can affect your entire body. The brain and nervous system, heart and blood vessels, immune system, digestive system, urinary system, muscles, bones, connective tissue, and the endocrine system which controls your hormones are all put into dis-ease. If that dis-ease is not dealt with, then your body will stay in dis-ease, which eventually becomes a disease. Your whole body is affected by those high levels of stress hormones. No organ system in the body is spared when fear, anxiety and stress is running wild in your thought life. That is why we are seeing so many diseases today coming out of fear, anxiety and stress. In fact, the hypothalamus responding to improper thinking and a lack of peace can set in motion over a hundred incurable diseases. You need to seriously think about this. You don't have to be a victim of disease. Life can be full of stressful circumstances which we cannot always control, but we can control our thought life and how we react to those circumstances so that stress doesn't affect us in a harmful way. As your mind starts going through the thinking process, you have the choice via your free will to stop that stress reaction in your body. So what types of anxiety and fear cause us to live in stage 2 and 3 of stress? Well, there are two main types of fear that we deal with. There are the superficial fears, for example, worrying about not having enough money. We may worry about our family's safety, or we may stress about meeting a deadline at work. Then there are the much deeper fears that come from victimization or a breach in relationships and a broken heart. Fear of man, fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of abandonment, fear of being vulnerable and trusting somebody again and so forth. We are seeing the more serious illnesses come from this type of fear. Most fear, anxiety and stress and disease is not fear of flying or fear of snakes. It is relationship breakdowns. The Bible gives us insight into this deeper type of fear in 1 John 4 verse 18. It says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. There are four parts to the scripture, and we need to look at each one. The first part is there is no fear in love. Now think with me, if we have not been loved, covered, nurtured, forgiven, accepted, if we have been verbally abused, emotionally abused, physically abused, sexually abused, or we are driven and into perfectionism because we are loved and accepted based on our achievement, do you think fear is at our door? Oh yes, you think about it. You are afraid of people that you don't feel safe with. You avoid them, don't you? It's okay if it's the stranger down the street, but if you live with that person every day, you're trapped. 
And then we get caught up about um, worrying if we're going to fail somebody's expectations. Is somebody going to like us or not like us? We are fearful about what others think about us. Do we measure up? There is no fear in love. So if you are not being loved perfectly, then there is fear that is lurking at your door. But that fear doesn't come to you and say, I am fear, I am going to get you. That fear comes with feelings. It comes with impressions. It comes with feelings of insecurity, not feeling safe. Projections of things that could go wrong in the future. Phobias. And you're about to develop a disease because your body's about to respond to your lack of peace. Competition, performance, drivenness, win at all cost, these are disease makers. Fibromyalgia which is where you have widespread pain and, chron and uh, also chronic fatigue syndrome, are all examples of diseases that develop as a result of drivenness to perform and perfectionism, because the person is loved based on achievement. In 1 John 4.18 it says that there is no fear in love. So if we have not been loved perfectly, and we are humiliated, victimized, abused, or are not being nurtured, loved and accepted, there is a potential for fear to come into our lives. Unless you have been delivered of that fear and you renew your mind with the Word of God, that fear will stay with you for the rest of your life and it will interfere with all of your relationships. It won't let you give and receive love. Some of you back off and you say, I'll never allow myself to be vulnerable again. I'll just withdraw inwardly and put up a wall of protection for myself. Nobody is ever going to hurt me again. And now you wonder why you have a disease. Satan and his kingdom know exactly what they are doing. When you have unresolved fear at this level, the enemy through the mind-body connection is, released, is releasing excessive quantities of cortisol, which is that stress hormone that is damaging almost every organ system in your body. Fear can also come in an early childhood and even in the womb through inherited iniquity. Colic is an example of inherited fear from the parents. Moving on to the second part of 1 John 4 verse 18, it says, Perfect love casts out fear. If you want to defeat diseases that are caused by fear, you are going to have to be prepared to receive love again. You are going to have to be prepared to have your fears driven out. You need to be willing to have your mind renewed by changing your thinking. The antidote to fear is love. The third part of 1 John 4 verse 18 is fear has torment. If you have fear, you are tormented. If you have peace, you have no torment. It is that fear that has torment that is the foundation of most psychiatric diseases. For example, paranoid schizophrenia multiple personality disorder, psychosis, mania in bipolar disorder, phobias, panic attacks, and anxiety disorders. It is a tormenting hell between the ears and in the depths of the heart. The fourth um, part of 1 John 4 verse 18 is, He who fears is not made perfect in love. If you have fear, you have not been made perfect in love. This means that you have fear because you have a breach somewhere in your relationships. It could be a breach in relationship between you and God. It could be a breach in relationship between you and yourself because you are holding yourself guilty and you won't forgive yourself for what you did in 1963. It may be a breach between you and another person. It could be anybody who was supposed to love you and didn't who did not cover you with love and acceptance, who did not nurture you and hug you and kiss you, who didn't forgive you and cover your weaknesses, who drove you and made you attempt to be perfect. This means that you don't feel safe in love and in relationships, and you are unable to give and receive love without fear. Have you ever hugged somebody and it was like hugging a telephone pole? You come to give these people a hug and they've got the don't touch me syndrome. About two seconds into the hug and they go, all right, all right, get away, that's enough. The fear that comes from broken relationships 
is the fear that is the foundation of over a hundred incurable diseases. That fear is going to stay there until you are delivered from it with perfect love that casts out fear. The antidote to these deep fears coming out of broken relationships is to receive perfect love, which is the love of the Father. And I'm going to speak more about that in session 19. Another way that we put our bodies into a toxic state of stage 2 and 3 of stress is through strife. James 3 verse 16 says, For where there is envying and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. When you are living in strife, you open the door to every evil work in your life. Strife includes bickering, bickering, arguing, fighting, gossiping, heated disagreements, and angry undercurrents. We've just learnt about the different stages of stress and how high levels of stress hormones adversely affect almost every organ system in your body, with the potential of leading to over a hundred incurable diseases. Remember, those stress hormones weaken the immune system, and that predisposes you to cancer and any type of bacterial, viral, fungal, or parasitic infection, literally any evil work, just as the Word of God says. We tend not to take strife seriously because we don't realize how serious it is. In Galatians 5, verse 19 to 21, strife is mentioned in the same verses as murder, adultery, fornication and witchcraft. Strife is like occultism in that it opens the door to almost any disease. A study was done at Ohio State University that proved that strife puts our bodies into that toxic state of stage 2 and 3 of stress. In the study, married couples were put in a room together with blood sampling needles in their arms. The blood samples could be taken at any time without the subjects knowing about it. A researcher then interviewed the couples and intentionally provoked a discussion that aroused disagreement or an argument. Samples were then taken during the disagreements, which showed that there were high levels of stress hormones. Women are often on the losing end of marital fights. For the man, it is over as soon as it happens, while the woman does not recover for a long time. There is a tremendous amount of damage that is done to the female immune system from strife in the home. 85 to 90 percent of people with allergies, fibromyalgia and many other diseases are female. The reason why the woman is the one who gets sick is she is the one who is more susceptible to the spiritual and emotional damage. God created the woman to be a responder to good strong spiritual leadership and not to abuse. In the study I was talking about, the woman had steeper increases in the stress hormone levels than the men. The test continued through an overnight hospital stay, and more blood samples were taken before discharge. The blood hormone levels were back to normal in the men, but the woman's stress hormone levels were still very high. Ephesians 4 verse 26 says, When angry, do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fury, or indignation last until the sun goes down. Now, do you understand the importance of this scripture when it comes to health and sickness? God is saying that if you don't deal with that issue by releasing and forgiving, you're going to have disease beginning in your body by morning. Romans 12 verse 18 says, If possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It's a lot more fun living in peace. It takes 17 facial muscles to smile, but 40 to frown. If you want to enjoy a long life of good health, you have got to keep the strife out of your life. And that includes your tongue. Ladies, I'm talking about gossip. Toxic words have the same detrimental effect on your health as toxic thoughts. 1 Peter 3 verse 10 says, For let him who wants to enjoy life and see good days, good whether apparent or not, keep his tongue free from evil. Overworking, where you do not get enough sleep and adequate rest, will also put your body into a toxic state of stage 2 and 3 of stress. In the world today, we live in an acceleration syndrome of rush, rush, hurry, hurry, busy, busy. In this toxic environment, 
the stress hormones are constantly flowing at high levels. They create a white noise effect that increases anxiety. It makes your thinking foggy and it impairs your ability to concentrate. And you begin to feel agitated, frustrated, tearful and even aggressive. As you know, those high levels of stress hormones will damage almost every organ system in your body. So adequate rest is a necessity, not a luxury. You may have fear in you simply because of the movies and the junk that you watch on television. When you watch horror films or movies with violence, rape, murder and the like, you are opening your mind and heart up to the spirit of fear, anxiety, torment, tragedy and horror. Then you wonder why that rubbish is coursing through your veins spiritually. The same goes for children. The demonic monsters in cartoons are the devil's first introduction to them. Ex-Satanists have informed me that some of the monsters in cartoons are what evil spirits really look like. Then when an evil spirit actually does appear to the child, the child is not frightened of it because the child has been desensitized by the cartoons and the child acqu acquires what is called an imaginary friend. Your eyes and your ears are the entrance points to your mind and your heart. The Bible says to guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. You have a responsibility to guard your heart in order to enjoy protection from God from fear and torment. Let's have a look at Isaiah 33 verse 14 to 16. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling seizes the godless ones. He who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes to avoid looking on evil, such a man will dwell in the heights. His place of defense will be the fortresses of rocks. His bread will be given to him, and water for him will be sure. The word is telling you that there is no protection for you from God if you don't guard your eyes and your ears from bloodshed and evil. When you watch that rubbish on TV, there is no protection for you from sleeplessness, sickness, and the projection of fear, tragedy, and horror in the future. You have allowed this into your life yourself. So turn that television off and teach your children to do the same. I'm calling you to stop opening your eyes and heart to that evil garbage that is desensitizing you to the Holy Spirit and condoning evil in your heart. Joyce Meyer tells the story of a man whose children were upset with him because he wouldn't allow them to go and watch a popular movie that all of the other children were going to watch. They complained that there was only a little violence, language and nudity in the movie, but it wasn't that bad. The next day the man baked his children some cookies. When he offered the cookies to them, he told them, I've added all the right ingredients, plus one extra ingredient, some dog poop. Now it is just a little, but it's not that bad. No matter what excuses the man made, his children would not eat the cookies. He then explained to them the same principle applies to movies and the spiritual poop that you allow in your heart. You need to be establishing God's kingdom on the earth, not enthroning evil. And if you have the fear of evil, you are a sitting duck for the very thing that you fear to come upon you. Job 3 verse 25 says, For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid is come unto me. Earlier in this session, I went into an in-depth discussion of 1 John 4 verse 18, which says that there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has torment. He that fears has not been made perfect in love. I explained that it is the fear that has torment that is the basis of most non-organic psychiatric disease. I would like to share a testimony with you about paranoid schizophrenia so that you can see this knowledge applied in real life in, in a practical way. For those of you who do not know what schizophrenia is, I'll briefly explain it to you. Schizophrenia does not mean a split personality as many people think. You most probably got that misconception from Hollywood movies. However, the movie called A Beautiful Mind, which starred Russell Crowe, was a very accurate portrayal of paranoid schizophrenia. A person who has schizophrenia experiences a loss of contact with reality. 
they have hallucinations and delusions, and in session 16, I'll explain in detail what hallucinations and delusions are. In some types of schizophrenia, the person has what is called disorganized speech and disorganized behavior. Disorganized speech can involve giving irrelevant answers to a question. For example, if I ask the person how they are doing today, they may reply something like bananas and doorknobs. Disorganized speech can also involve derailment and tangentiality, which is where the person keeps um, derailing from their train of thought, uh, or when they try to tell you something and they never get back to the point. For example, this morning I had eggs for breakfast. Eggs come from chickens. Chickens are birds. Birds are animals that can fly. I flew in a plane once. Sometimes the speech of a schizophrenic can be incoherent, where you just can't understand what they are saying. Their speech can be filled with neologism, which means that they make up words, or their speech can be like a word salad, which is a mixture of words that are not sentences that make sense. They can have verbigoration, which means meaningless repetition of words, or blocking, which is where they have a sudden interruption in, in a train of thinking. Their face can be expressionless, which is called a blunting, uh, a blunting of effect. Disorganized behavior can involve what is called catatonic behavior. For example, they keep a part of their body in a rigid posture, or they have pecu peculiar purposeless movements, such as repetitive grimacing. A person with schizophrenia is often not able to control their emotions. For example, they'll have aggressive, violent outbursts. They can exhibit inappropriate social or sexual behavior, and they can have obsessions or compulsions, as well as suicidal or homicidal idea ideas or attempts. This is where psychiatric drugs are important for the moment, otherwise the person is dangerous to themselves and others. Because of their loss of contact with reality, they cannot cope with interpersonal relationships, and they cannot function in society or hold down a full-time job. So that paints the picture of a schizophrenic for you. Paranoid schizophrenia is a type of schizophrenia where the person has hallucinations and delusions that are fear-related. That is what paranoia means. It is caused by the excessive overproduction of two chemicals in the brain called noradrenaline and dopamine. Paranoid schizophrenia does not usually come on a person until their late teens or early twenties. It is not genetically inherited, but it follows family trees which have dysfunctional relationships. There is often abuse involved, whether it is verbal abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, or sexual abuse. There is always an atmosphere of strife, victimization, fear, and not feeling safe. 1 John 4 verse 18 says that he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So the home is filled with a lack of love, and therefore fear comes in the door. That fear puts the person into stage two and three of stress. There is an overproduction of stress hormones in the body, including the overproduction of noradrenaline in the brain, and that is what causes the symptoms of paranoia in paranoid schizophrenia. The other half of the profile of paranoid schizophrenia is the overproduction of dopamine, which is the pleasure chemical in the body. This involves rebellion, Rebellion is an altered state of consciousness in values and environmental positioning of thought. For example, let's say you are growing up as a child in a home that is not safe. You don't feel safe in love with your father or your family. While you are little, you are under their thumb, so you are fine. But as you get older, you go more and more into rebellion. This is what rebellion says. I don't like what you represent or what you are doing. I don't feel safe in this environment, so I'm going to withdraw from the world into my own safe place where I can protect myself from you, and I am really sane and you are not. That is the mindset of paranoid schizophrenia. The fear behind that mindset causes the overproduction of noradrenaline and dopamine, which then causes the disturbance in the person's thought processes and the symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia. When people have paranoid schizophrenia, nobody wants to be around them because they just can't seem to meet them. 
They live in a world of their own that is not our world, and they don't really want to be a part of our world because they are afraid. Henry Wright was one te once teaching about paranoid schizophrenia in a conference in Minnesota. In the audience was one man who had a brother with paranoid schizophrenia who had already committed suicide. He had a second brother who was being picked up by the police all the time and he should have been incarcerated. As this man was sitting in the audience, he heard Henry Wright make a statement from 1 John 4 verse 18, which is perfect love casts out fear. And he had this thought about his brother. What if I started loving my brother and not avoiding him? What if the word of God is true? And what if Pastor Wright and what he is teaching is the key to my brother's healing? Two years later, this man showed up in a conference that Henry Wright was doing in Dallas, Texas. This man approached Henry and he said, Pastor Wright, I've got to tell you the story of my brother's healing. Every Saturday for two to three hours in the afternoon, I would go and see my brother to spend time with him, to find a place to communicate with him and just to love him. In one year of taking my Saturdays just to love my brother, I watched my brother go from advanced paranoid schizophrenia on high doses of lithium to normal, no medication and holding down a full-time job. He is totally sane today because of one truth, perfect love casts out fear. Let me tell you from a medical perspective what happened on a, on a physical level. When this man began to feel love, he began to identify with a different type of environment from the home that he had grown up in and he began to trust again. He began to open his heart to the realization that maybe somebody really did love him. As he began to respond to his brother's love, the stage two and three stress reaction was broken. Rebellion began to diminish, dopamine and norepinephrine levels returned to normal, and the, and the <coughs> chemical foundation of paranoid schizophrenia was over. Insanity was all that was left. I learned a very big lesson from this case history, and many others like it. Healing begins with people having empathy for one another, having compassion for one another, and being prepared to do what it takes to show love to a person who needs help. I've learned as a doctor that people who come to me are not really patients, they are not clients, they are special people who have such extreme value that the son of this man, who is the king of kings, found it worthwhile to give his life to save me. So they are my brother and sister and in Christ. And if they are not saved, they are my inheritance. Because God said in Psalm 2 verse 8, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. The Bible says in Matthew 18 verse 11 to 13, that there is more value in the one sheep over the cliff than the 99 safe in the fold. The Bible says that nobody is expendable. Everybody has value. And you are the God that healeth. You are a God that reigns on high. You are a God of mercy. And your grace.